Hello, everybody. Uh, it is Paul and Peter. Good afternoon. Those of you in the United Kingdom, an absolutely exquisite day. Um, thank you for joining us live. We'll also thank you for those who are watching on a rebroadcast when it rebroadcasts. Um, I'm going to just wait for the traditional 30 seconds and then we're going to um, kick off. And in the meantime, Peter and I are just going to gab about the fact that you've got houses over your left ear and I've got Mandela and they're looking at each other. I, I love the, the little <laughs> South Africanism. For those of you who are not in on the gag, that's how South Africans greet each other, the word houses that's behind Peter's ear. <laughs> Okay, we're going to kick off. Peter, great to see you as always. Um, let's start with the kind of vaccine news because it's sort of potentially big news, the, the latest results out of the US. Um, tell us how big of a deal it is, uh, how much of a breakthrough it is, uh, how much certainty there can be attached to these initial preliminary results. Yeah, so a little bit of news out of the, this vaccine trial from Moderna in um, the US and a little bit from the one here in Oxford in the UK, none of which I would call a breakthrough. I would just call it a promising small step forward. So the Moderna um, vaccine is um, uh, in phase one trials, which is the first kind of level of human trials where you're really just taste testing for kind of safety for the most part in humans. And, um, and there were some informal reports about results from the first eight people, I believe, who received that vaccine. Um, that number one, they seemed to tolerate it fine and there were no safety concerns, which is a good thing. And that second, that they did demonstrate the production of neutralizing antibodies after receiving the vaccine, which doesn't tell us that the vaccine is effective necessarily, um, or that it makes you immune, or how long that it works, that this will work for everybody. But what it does show is that there is a dose response in the sense that you give somebody the vaccine, and it does indeed trigger the immune response whereby the body produces some antibodies. If it didn't do that, that would be extremely concerning about whether we could expect any clinical efficacy. So it's good news that it does. It's not a massive breakthrough. It's still really early days, right? This initial trial is supposed to have, I think, 45 people. Um, the next will be a, usually a phase two trial that should have hundreds of people, which will be actually trying to start to look for effectiveness in the real world and also sometimes look at, at, at different doses. So um, somewhat promising. It's been funny to see their stock tank because they said, hey, look, amazing results. And then a bunch of scientists like me said, that's fine, but it's not such a big deal. Um, everyone's overreacting one way or the other. Let's just keep a level head and say, this one is still on track. The Oxford one, the sort of news that probably a lot of you saw from the last couple of days was that they um, uh, uh, published some results from, uh, from macaques, you know, rhesus monkeys, which are the monkeys most like humans biologically, at least in terms of some of this immune stuff, and basically found that also it elicited an immune response, and that while the, the three monkeys who were vaccinated um, actually were able to get infected, they didn't get pneumonia. Um, and they did show antibodies. So some promising results in, uh, in, in those few monkeys that were studied. Of course, we're still waiting for preliminary results from the human trials that are ongoing. And if you get infected, but you don't get pneumonia, is, is that akin to asymptomatic infection? Or is it just that you're feeling lousy, it just doesn't get up to critical levels? You're on mute. There we go. Okay. Sorry, this is my backup. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to hold this phone here. I'm still saying, how's it? Um, the the Wi-Fi went down. Hopefully, this will hold for us. Can you repeat the question, Paul? Sorry. I, I'm uh, A, that was wildly quick recovery. I'm very impressed. Uh, and secondly, the question was, if it is uh, that you got pneumonia, you were infected but didn't get pneumonia, that's like 
sort of asymptom carrying it asymptomatically does it or does it mean you actually do get symptoms you just don't get the really serious ones that are likely to lead to 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 fatalities uh we don't know so much i think the the message really is that they were able to detect the virus from the respiratory tract of some of those vaccinated monkeys but they didn't seem to get particularly sick and they didn't have clinical evidence of pneumonia. Um, it's, it's just probably too early to draw conclusions further than that. I'd be happier, of course, if a vaccine prevented you from getting infected at all. Um, but this was an experimental study done very quickly with just six monkeys. We don't know a lot about dosing and things yet. So um, it's promising in the, in the sense that it was safe. It elicited an immune response with antibodies that you could measure and that the ones who didn't get it got pretty sick and the ones who did get it didn't get sick. That's kind of all we know right now. Great. Before we went live, you said that there were kind of a couple of relevant studies that you, our listeners will be interested in uh, around immunity and around masks and about spreading. Tell us about those. They sound really interesting. Yeah. So, you know, there's so much coming out. I mean, hundreds of studies every week. Most of them haven't been peer reviewed. A lot of this gets picked up by the news and it's hard to know what to make of it. So I thought maybe a quick tour of some of the stuff that caught my eye this week that might actually matter would be would be helpful. And there's three studies to share quickly. Um, the first was a study around the use of masks. And this is actually an animal study with hamsters. Um, but in short, based Basically, what they found was that the use of masks reduced transmission of COVID-19 by about 75 percent. Um, uh, and that's particularly when the one who was sick and transmitting was wearing a mask. So it reinforces our, our understanding that the main use of masks, is, you know, my wearing a mask is to protect others because if I'm either sick or shedding virus because I'm infected without knowing it, it's going to prevent it from getting aerosolized into the, into the atmosphere or, you know, spewing those droplets silently. But that's a pretty big reduction. Um, again, we don't know that that translates perfectly to humans, but it's a pretty resounding endorsement of the fact that, well, gosh, maybe we face coverings are probably pretty important. Um, and, you know, we've, um, we've seen in some places that's become sort of the norm in a policy recommendation. Here in the UK, not so much, but it kind of makes me wonder whether we want to be pushing more for face coverings and, and, and masks, non-medical masks, to be a much more routine thing everywhere. You know, it doesn't hurt that when you look at the places that have done this really well in Asia, that's been the norm for a long time. So that's number one. Number two um, is about immunity. You know, we've talked about the fact that we don't know how long you might be immune for if you recover from this infection. And if, if there's ever a vaccine, how long will it last for? We just don't know. Um, but what we know from other coronaviruses is that immunity can be fairly fleeting. Really interesting study published the other day that was looking to see whether there was any cross immunity from people who had SARS back in 2003 that might protect them against COVID. Actually, two studies here. So the first thing was that for the most part, they found no, if you had SARS and recovered it, it doesn't protect you against COVID at all. However, they did find that a lot of those people actually still had antibodies that lasted anywhere from nine to 17 years after SARS and appeared to have some protection. So what that means is that in another coronavirus, which is not dissimilar to COVID-19, people who had developed antibodies and an immune response retained that for a decade or so. Um, and so that gives us a little more optimism that immunity after COVID-19 infection or vaccine could be longer lasting. That's a really, really, really good sign, not a guarantee. Um, there was also a discovery of a particular antibody in one of those people that appears to maybe give some protection against both and could be an interesting therapeutic target. Um, but that's probably smaller news right now. We don't know too much. The last thing I want to talk about is, um, is about how COVID-19 spreads. We always hear about the, the R, right? The transmission, the, um, the, the R naught, which is, um, you know, the number of people that are infected by each infected person um, and how important that is to get below one. So we talk about that 
without remembering that it's really an average, right? And so if the R is two, that doesn't necessarily mean that if I'm infected, I'm gonna infect two other people. That's just the average across the board. What appears to be emerging actually is that there's a big variance in how contagious people are and that a small number of people appear to be incredibly contagious and infect many others, whereas a lot of other people may be infected and not infect anybody else. Um, there's another letter to introduce, another little public health term called the dispersion factor, which is known as the K as opposed to the R. And um, when it's high, like one um, or above one, that means that it's pretty dispersed, meaning most people are about the same level of contagious. When it's lower, it means that some people are super contagious, other people are less contagious. Here it appears to be pretty low. Um, a, a guy at the London School called Adam Kucharski is really good at this stuff, estimates it's about 0.1, which would suggest that 80% of the infections are coming from 10% of cases. So we don't know why that is, but it lends credence to what we're seeing about this, the notion of kind of these super spreader events where you see a lot of cases coming from one choir practice in Washington, which was published this week, or Mardi Gras, or someone visiting a bar in South Korea last week where 63 or so people were infected. Um, we don't know why it might be have something to do with the people's immune system. It might have something to do with what they're doing. Certain behaviors like singing and sneezing aerosolize the virus a lot more. Um, but it it's just so interesting because if we could figure that out, that could give us another means of control. One thing we do know is that super spreader type events appear to be more important in the overall propagation of this pandemic than we thought early on. And it's always worse when it's indoors in an enclosed area. Um, and so I think limiting gatherings and enclosed spaces is really important. So I just found that fascinating and you know, we'll see what, what we can learn from that. So if it's, if the super spreading uh, idea is from an activity, something that you do or a location, that would have a different sort of public health or behavioral implication from a certain person who sheds 10x virus who themselves are a super spreader, would be a super spreader wherever they are and whether they were singing or walking in a park. Um, because in some ways you would think, you would have quite different policy responses uh, and advice. Because I find it hard to imagine what you would do if it turned out that 80% of the cases came from 10% of the people and it wasn't what they did, it was just that they were particularly you know, virulent in their spreading. Hard to figure out what to do, right? Yeah, it, it might be that, you know, based on individual immune systems that somebody is, you know, shedding more virus or in some ways more of that is going to be coming out. It could be related to activities, you know, certain things that you're doing. You know, normally we think this spreads through droplets, which are these microscopic particles that go a certain distance after, say, you cough and then it falls down to the ground. But when it aerosolizes, which is a much smaller particles, when it floats around in the air, and we've seen in the news some of these studies that say, oh, it can last in the air for eight minutes or 14 minutes, et cetera. So maybe if there are certain things that are causing more aerosolization, um, you know, that could be a target. I'm wary always of the term super spreader because I don't want to put this kind of like this label on humans as if it's like their fault, but there are super spreading events where one gathering of people leads to a lot of infections. It also is super interesting because when you look back to January and February, you know, people were traveling out of China all over the place and out of Wuhan in the early days. In some places the epidemic hit and other places it didn't right away. And so it might just be that all these kind of embers were shot around the world and some of them fizzled out and some of them kind of caught fire. So it's just, it's different. You know, flu is about one, meaning most people with flu are contagious in the same ways. This appears to be quite different in that, you know, you and I may um, be very different in terms of how much risk others around us may have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be a really interesting area of further study and it just kind of help us understand, um, you know, we, we need to get ever more sophisticated in how we figure out how to get back to life and still control this thing. Um, and so there could be clues here. So let me ask you another question about um, we, we've, we've, we've spoken about schools a fair amount, and, and, uh, and, and I think it's relevant because there's a, a raging debate right here in the UK. I know that you're a kind of participant in that debate. 
um, but it also has so many consequences for young people, their own health, parents, grandparents, second waves. So give us a, a just a sense of where you think that debate has moved and, and where you sit on the question of, as of June 2nd, whether you know, these three mysteriously selected years of school children should be going back to school or not. Yeah, I think the, the first message to me is that this is not settled science by any stretch of the imagination. I think there are, um, there are, you know, there, there are little bits of data here and there and anecdotal experience. Anyone who says the scientific advice clearly tells us one thing or the other, um, I just don't think is, is, is probably accurate in, in saying so. This is an area where um, I think there's so much uncertainty and so much that we don't no, um, and that's something that we have to um, we have to really keep in mind as um, as we move forward in this debate. So, in general, um, ch children tend to get infected, but have a fairly low likelihood of getting severe infection and in an extremely low likelihood of dying. Um, now, uh, the asterisk to that is this. Um, this cluster of these Kawasaki-like inflammatory syndromes that appear to be related, which are now over 200 between the UK, a couple of other European countries and the US, and have caused some deaths. That's to me is just a flag of, hey, here's something we don't understand. It's rare, but not super rare. I would like to know more. In general, though, kids tend not to get infected. Overall, on the question of how likely are kids to spread it to other people, the answer is we don't know. Um, it's been hard to find a lot of evidence that kids are spreading it around a lot. Um, and so if anything, yeah, maybe it appears that kids are a little bit less likely to be spreading it to others. But I would say I'm not convinced that's the case. It's more of an absence of evidence um, situation at this time. Um, so you take those first things and say, well, let's balance that against the risks of keeping millions of kids out of school, falling behind in their education, being locked at home, having a higher risk of um, abuse and other kinds of things, food insecurity from kids who rely on school lunches. Um, you know, there's always gonna be balancing risk and benefits. So some are saying, let's get back. Um, and we have seen that happen in some cases safely in places like Denmark. Um, in other places like France, there have been some challenges as they've moved back and there have already been some, um, some transmission in schools just in the first few weeks that France was back. My position on this overall is that um, I think we all agree that we want to get kids back to school as soon as possible, as soon as we can do it safely. Um, and and that the, the caveat is, how do we know and what's it going to take to make it safe enough? Um, there are things that we need to be able to do to make sure that we're minimizing the risk. A lot of that comes down to surveillance um, and knowing where the hotspots are, knowing how much transmission is already happening in a given community, and then our ability to actually then test and trace and, and break any chains of transmission if it happens. So right now, if a teacher or a child were to get infected, or to get symptoms, I should say, of COVID-19, and they couldn't get tested, they're supposed to stay home and everybody else goes about their business. Um, that's kind of what's happening, right? What needs to happen is that child or teacher immediately get to test, that that bubble or that classroom or possibly that school gets closed and disinfected while contact tracing happens, everybody else gets tested, isolated, et cetera, et cetera. Now, government promises that all of us will be able to get those tests and at the contact tracing, everything's gonna be ready by June 1st. Um, and I just have to say that um, I, I appreciate that aspiration, but I wanna see it before I wanna send my child back to do that. And that's, that's been essentially my calculus that you haven't inspired confidence thus far. You've made a lot of promises you haven't been able to keep. So please keep working at it. Please prove me wrong. But I wanna know that those things are in place first um, before doing so. There are some other things we've been talking about. We have to keep in mind, of course, that we're not just talking about kids, we're talking about teachers and other workers and their safety as well. Um, some kids, some teachers, some other staff members have medical vulnerabilities or family members who do. Um, and so that is going to be uh, something that we have to think about. We've done a really bad job of, of protecting health workers, care home workers, and other key workers in the past, let's make sure we're not gonna repeat that mistake with staff. So on the whole, I think 
it's good that we're planning in detail for this and that we're having this conversation. I feel like June 1st is a little bit too soon and any benefit from getting a few levels of kids back into school right now might be outweighed by both the risk and just the uncertainty. So I'd rather sort of wait a few weeks and keep pushing to put all the right infrastructure in place. Um, the other thing that, um, that I worry about is that levels of transmission in the UK are still fairly high, right? Now we're seeing obviously a real decline from our peak. Um, and so there are fewer cases, there are fewer deaths. That's a really positive sign. We hope that trend continues, but like it's hard to compare the UK to Denmark and say, well, if Denmark opened their schools, we'll do the same thing here and it'll be fine because Denmark has maybe a 10th um, probably less than a tenth of the level of transmission that is currently happening in the UK. So I'd rather see more of a sustained decline because it means the risk of infection is going to be lower when we start. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, without being strident or cavalier about the debate, the, the one thing that if you're in a country where the death rate remains that stubbornly high where the excess death rates have been frankly enormous, um, it becomes difficult to know what you lose because there's only really six weeks of education left at best. What you lose by pausing, looking at best practice, seeing what's worked and hasn't worked in other jurisdictions or contexts, uh, and then, um, and then sort of acting accordingly and seeing the extent to which it's led to second waves in other countries. And so, so it seems that the, the cost benefit equation, even though there are definitely costs in keeping kids at home, uh, is a much, the, the, the costs are lower than the potential costs of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of kids, you know, uh, going back into the front line absent real data. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? How many times have we said that? Um, and these are our kids we're talking about. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, that's that's certainly where um, where I fall on this equation. I think we'll learn a lot more. Other thing that we need to keep in mind is that you know we've schools have really struggled with you know sort of this move to kind of virtual education and and not in person education. You know, particularly a lot of state schools without great resources. Um, there's no guarantee that even when we start to get back that we're gonna be able to deliver everything in person. And so I, I feel like on both sides that being more intentional and in planning to be able to execute this really well, um, rather than rushing to do it in ways that are really gonna stress out. I mean, I've been working with teachers unions and some schools on this and they're working incredibly hard, but like they're afraid, they don't know what to do. The government guidance has been that they've been getting is, um, is rapid and a bit all over the place. And they're kind of saying, well, it's up to each school or locality to figure it out, as opposed to saying, this is the minimum readiness package safety package that a school needs to have before it can open. And so that's one of the things that we've been pushing for as well. So I, I just think it needs a bit more time. Um, it does sound like from my conversations that the government is going to review the evidence on May 28th and then kind of make a final call about whether or not to open schools two days later. So this is not at all a settled decision. It's going to be made kind of in real time with the data. And that sounds crazy, but actually I think that's not a bad thing. Um, it makes sense to kind of get a bit closer um, before, before making that call. So I wouldn't be surprised actually if it, if it didn't move ahead or it didn't move ahead in a lot of places. Let me ask a question that's triggered by a, by a question from one of our, our viewers. Um, said viewer has antibodies thinks they have immunity or, or suspects that having antibodies may give you immunity, thinking of going to the US uh, now, visit a parent and on the assumption that things are going to get worse in the US before they get better. So I guess the question there is, um, looking at the US, uh, a country where the president is taking unproven anti-malarial medicines and announcing that during live press conferences, um, and given the real split screen that's happening there between different states which are adopting entirely different approaches. Give us a sense of how you think the US is going to deal with uh, just dampening this down, a second wave, and just the disparate responses happening with different states. Is, is the US going to get worse before it gets better? 
Um, you know, it might just muddle along and continue to have a, um, uh, a, a, a slow burn. A slow burn is probably not the right term because we're still talking about tens of thousands of infections and, and thousands of deaths per day. Um, I think we, we've seen sort of a plateau in some of the numbers in the U.S. if you just look nationally. Um, as sort of things have come down in New York. And so, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of variability across the country. I think what we might see is we're gonna see kind of these sustained levels of transmission and continuing the death toll to inch up and inch up and inch up um, in a lot of places, along with these flare ups, right? We've seen lots of flare ups around care homes, around meatpacking plans and occasional other super spreader events that will then need to be kind of tamped out. So I, I think that one possible scenario is is not that there's a big second wave, at least in the in the coming weeks to months, and not that there's a sustained decline towards zero. That's definitely not happening. Um, but that we see somewhere in between um, where there continues to be unnecessary infection, suffering, and death, um, and it's just going to continue along like this. So the U.S. it strikes me as it's the place because of its unusual constitutional structure, and arguably that structure is part of the genius of the United States, that it devolves down governance to a low level and it allows for regional and state-by-state -state flexibility. But precisely because of the deep political divisions there, it's very difficult to see this being dealt with in a consistent and rigorous way across the entire country. I think it's well nigh impossible. And therefore it is, unusually reliant on efficacious treatments and a vaccine in order for this to be produce some degree of resolution. I mean, it's not Norway, Denmark, and New Zealand, small, highly structured, culturally homogenous, uh, rule-abiding cultures. This is not it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so the first thing to point out is the obvious which is the U.S. is not the only country that has a sort of devolved or decentralized governance system in which you have a balance of sort of um, national and, and, and regional or local control, right? Germany is similar in many ways. Brazil is similar in many ways. There are many other places that you could sort of list, right? So it's not necessarily about the system itself. That presents a certain set of opportunities and challenges. This is all squarely on a totally failed federal response and, and absence of leadership, right? And it, what's clear is that that's not going to change. Um, I, don't, I don't think knowing everything we know about the last three and a half years, um, uh, as well as the last couple of months, that anything is going to change or get better out of the White House until November, right? Um, and, uh, and we can pray there's a change in leadership at that time. Just about anybody would be probably more competent than the current leadership. You know, that just is a fact, I think. Um, so in the meantime, it's going to continue to get ugly and it's hard to see the U.S. not remaining the, um, the leader in COVID infections and deaths for a long time. Um, but you're right, you know, we, there, there are a couple of ways to control this, right? You can control through public health responses, um, testing, tracing, all the other stuff we've been talking about ad nauseum, or you can control it through kind of medical, um, you know, interventions like treatments to reduce the death toll or ultimately kind of the vaccine. And, um, uh, you know, we can hope and pray that that's going to help in the U.S. and elsewhere, but, um, um, it, you know, the country continues to be in a mess. Peter, um, we are out of time. Uh, thank you for uh, very gamely uh, dealing with a mobile phone and a backup system throughout this, very admirably done. Uh, and um, as always, we will, um, we'll see you next week, but thank you so much for the, for the insights as always. Thank you, stay safe everyone. Stay safe and stay well, ciao, bye.